Then also what we want to make sure is taking place is that we're structuring our community, our language in a way where we understand the church is never a building. The church is people. The church is people. And listen, I love buildings. I'm so excited for a permanent space. But listen, we can never get married to a physical location that we forget to be married to the bride of Christ and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We got to know that. Some of us love bricks more than we love the brick maker. And what I love about the question that we're bringing into today is what happens now? Because we often hear that miracles are around the corner. It's my season of breakthrough. It's my season of moving into what God has for me. But what actually is taking place in my life, in the life of the church, with my friends? What's happening? And so what I wanted to say to you as we start this series is welcome to the miracle. P.S. If your life is messy, you're in the best place for a miracle to take place. A lot of times what we think is when it comes to a miracle in our life, it's got to be pristine. It's got to be clean. It's got to be ready. Everything needs to look good. We need to have a full plan. We need to make sure everything is Clorox wiped down. There's no shoes. Like everything's great. But can I tell you, most of the time where you need a miracle is not where everything's already put together. It's where things are displaced. But what's fascinating is what many people think, my life is displaced right now. I'm in shambles right now. Man, God probably can't work with my situation. But maybe if I would pray a little bit more, if I would work a little bit harder, if I would do a little bit more of what I'm already doing, then breakthrough would happen. But friend, could I present to you the method for your miracle is not working more for the miracle but it's following the posture of what God has already said to receive a miracle. So what we're going to do over the next few moments is I'm going to dive into a book in the Bible that orchestrates so perfectly the season many of us are in. And then I'm going to give you a few points and then share with you what's happening in the life of the church. So if you got your Bible with you, you can turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Luke was a doctor. If you don't know this, anytime you're maybe having a sickness or you have something going on in your body that's not good, you should go see a doctor. The reason why is because they're very detailed. They don't just skip over to the fun facts of what they like, but they get involved what's taking place. And can I tell you that Luke being a doctor, that is exactly what he did. He was someone that would pray for miracles, but also would give an ibuprofen whenever there was a headache. Luke is an example that you can still have faith and practice modern medicine, modern wisdom at the same time. And so as we dive in today, we see very clearly there's some details about the life of the church, the life of miracles, but also the life of living with the conviction that the best is yet to come, but God has a great work for me to partake in today. So with that being said, if you got your Bible with you ready to go, say, let's go. Let's go. So one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake, The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So this is right after Jesus is baptized. He's partaking in his ministry. He's doing what he did. And it says now he's at the shore and the people are beginning to crowd around him. A little better translation would be an understanding of a picture that there is a massive mob that is moving against him, pushing him up against the water. So think about this. Jesus was called to ministry. Amen. Okay, amen. He was called to ministry. Let's try it again. I want us to all agree on that. Jesus was called to the ministry of the world. Everybody say amen. amen. Okay, it's a great commission. Go into all the world. So he was doing what his ministry was, but he was being surrounded by a mob that was pushing up against him where he couldn't turn left or right, up or down without a need, without a desire. So he's doing what God called him to do, but he wasn't doing it in a way that allowed him to function in the fullness of what he was doing. Some of us in here today, maybe you're doing what God has called you to do, but you haven't created areas in your life, a place where you can actually function in the fullness of what is taking place. So Jesus, knowing this, it says that he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Everybody say, sit down. Verse number four. When he had finished speaking and teaching, he said to Simon Peter, hey, put your boat back into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. 
And Simon Peter answered, Master, he would have known that Jesus was a rabbi this moment right before he's called into ministry. He would have known who he was. There would have been influence in that day. That's why he let a random stranger get in his boat and tell him what to do. He said, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. You ever been working all through the night and not caught anything? But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Notice that Peter didn't say, because you say so, I will find other people to do it for me. Because you say so, I will let the hired hands do it. No, but because you say so, I will take responsibility and I will do it myself. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partner into the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Think about it. A blessing so full that they couldn't even contain it. A blessing so full that they began to think, I think we're actually sinking. Let me encourage you. Some of you are praying for great things in your life. I desire it for you. I pray for it often. But I pray also that you would have a big enough boat to carry what God's going to bring. Thank goodness Jesus was in the situation. He was able to take care of it. But how unfortunate it would have been if it would have said, and they got the biggest catch there had ever been, and they put it in the boat. But because they didn't take care of their boats, they sunk to the ground, and they're still there to this day, as Scripture always says. That would be a depressing story. That would be very unfortunate, but luckily Peter was a craftsman. He had been a man that was about his business. He was a fisherman. He knew how to get his boat ready. But can I tell you, sometimes you can get your boat to the greatest degree of your doing, but it's still not enough to hold what God wants to do in your life. But can I tell you, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because you may be doing everything the good book says. You may be following, you may be trusting, you may be moving on. But then you're starting to get everything that you desired. And you're going, I don't think I can hold this. I think I'm beginning to sink. Can I tell you, that's where you got to lean on the Holy Spirit. That's where you don't commit to your understanding, but commit to his understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And what will he do? He will make your paths straight. He will make your paths straight. So Jesus gets in the boat teaches at a place of sitting, and then all of a sudden he blesses these people beyond what they can even imagine. Story goes on, and then he says, hey, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. It's a translation for that day of saying, I will make you one of the wisest individuals of this time because people will be compelled by the greatest gospel and the wisest story you've ever heard. So today what I want to do is have a conversation very quick and give you four truths about a miracle that's true not only of our church but our individual lives at the same time. The first thing I want you to see is this right here. Margin creates miracles. Say it with me. Margin creates miracles. Verse number three. Whenever Jesus was pushed up against the shore, what did he do? He looked at the boat and he said, I need to get in and push off from the shore. I need to create some margin." I need to create some space. Now think about this. Jesus' whole reason for being here was to save the lost, to be our great Savior, to be the Redeemer. But how come whenever that was taking place on the shoreline, he had to stop the work of the ministry so he could create some margin and space to do the work of the ministry? Here's why. You're not called to live your life being reactive to everything but you're called to live your life being proactive in what God has called you to so what that means is you need to create some margin in your life margin for the spirit of God to move margin of Sabbath taking a day of rest margin of allowing some pace from people there's some of you here you're so generous but you say yes to every single person but you're never saying yes to yourself and eventually you will pour out and run dry You have to create margin in your life, not only so you can get a moment to breathe, but a moment where you can get the house ready. You ever had someone come over to your house for dinner and then you begin to cook dinner or right before and you realize to your horror, you don't have all the ingredients that you need. You ever been there? I've been there. I'll say the worst experience was I went over to uh, someone's house once for dinner and for dinner we just had smoothies and they they waited until we made the smoothie to eat. And I don't know if you've ever had dinner but with a smoothie, but that's not a long experience. It's not like a four-course smoothie will. You would literally get your smoothie, you drank your smoothie, they made everyone else's, and it was like, okay, I guess dinner's done, bye-bye, like we're out the door. 
Why do I share that? It has nothing spiritual, just randomly on my mind. There you go. Okay. So that moment happened. A little chuckle. Ha ha. All right. But what happens is if your house is not in order, whenever you have guests that come through, whenever you try to set the table, you won't have the ingredients and the things you need to set the table. So the very table that you were called and orchestrated to set, you won't have the capacity to do so. Why? Because you didn't create margin to go to Aldi's or to BOGO Publix and get what you need. you got to create margin in your life. But the reason Jesus created margin in his life was so he could sit down. Everybody say sit down. Sit down. In Jewish scripture and understanding of teaching, whenever a rabbi would sit down, it means that they were in a posture of full understanding and authority, but also had a full understanding of what God was revealing to them, that their yoke, their teaching was fully ready to present. So when Jesus sits down, he's created a posture of margin so that he can breathe, get his business together, figure out what the Lord is saying, and now said, okay, now let's get to work. Why? Because if you... Know God, you'll know peace. But know God, no peace. Let's all say that together. Know God, no peace. Know God, no peace. It's not an original thought, but it's a profound thought. Jesus understood, I need to create some space in my life. I need to sit down, make sure that the ministry isn't just a pop-off, but we can actually create some space so we can continue the work of ministry. But to do that, I have to know what God is doing. Because if you know what God is doing and do what God says to do, then you will see the peace of God and the fullness of God. But if you don't know what God is doing and you don't do what God says to do, you will not have peace. There's a lot of good people in Miami that love the Lord, but they don't spend time talking to the Lord. So what happens is they live a life stressed out, never sleeping, never taking Sabbath, never spending time in their word, and they don't know what's going on. And they're upset at the Lord that he's not giving them peace. And God's saying, listen, Martha, if you would be like Mary and just sit at the feet of Jesus, take time to be in my presence, you can know the heart of God. And when you know the heart of God, you begin to have a heart that echoes that heart. And when your heart is in rhythm with the one that created all things, sustains all things, is in all things, can I tell you, you won't be anxious or worried. You won't be stressed out and wondering what's going to happen. You'll have moments of feeling human, but yet again, you'll go back to the anchor knowing God is my inheritance. I can be at peace. But to do that, you got to create margin in your life. You got to sit down, know what the God of the universe is saying. And then you can teach. But then what I think is interesting in this story, this is like a little bonus point because it's so profound. This has to do with Peter right here. Because think about this. Peter is just a random fisherman. He's going throughout his day. He's not looking for anything special today. He wants to get some fish so he can provide for his table. He wants to take care of his kids, getting a little Long John Silvers. That's it. But when the rabbi shows up, The man of God, for his culture, he knew would have been the representation of their religious capacity. He said, okay, I'm going to make it my business now to be about this man's business. Here's your point right here. When your priority is God's business, he will provide for your business. When your priority, number one, uno, is God's business, he'll take care of your business. What happens is many of us, we want God to be about our business And if we feel like he's about our business, then I'll be about God's business. Can I tell you, it does not work that way. Deuteronomy makes it very plain. It goes out all throughout scripture in verse 23, chapter 23, where it talks about all the things that if you do what God will do. Listen, God will still love you. You'll still get to heaven, but you can't pray for blessings if you're not doing what God said to get the blessing. It's just the reality. You can't pray for God to bless your marriage if you're walking in idolatry. You can't pray for God to bless your mind if you're just gossiping all the time and letting your ears just hear every single thing. I love you. You can't pray for God to bless your diabetes if you're still going to Big Mac all the time and Burger King and McDonald's. Like, God, bless these fries as they're going in. Like, if you got a sodium problem, lay off the salt. Like, these are basic things. But what we want to do sometimes, and when I say you, it's not uh, us. I'm just saying the context of the Western church. We want to pray for the blessings of God, but we don't want the responsibility for the blessing or to maintain the blessing. 
But when you notice it about Peter, Peter is in a deficit. He has no fish. He's going to have to pay extra. There's not going to be able to pay the tax from the oppression of Roman. He is in a bad situation. And honestly, he doesn't have time for this crazy religious man right now. But what he said was, you know what? In all that I do, I'm going to put my affection, my desire on the Lord. So what did he do? He said, God, I commit my ways to you. And notice whenever he responded that way to God, God took care of his business in such a way that the nets were overflowing with blessing. I just feel this in my heart. If you're a business owner in this place, let me encourage you for your own homework. Go look at scripture and look what it means like to tithe off of your blessing to the local church. Go look what it means to take care of your employees, making sure that they have all the benefits you have as well. Healthcare, 40K, 403B. Look at all those different things. Why am I saying that? What I'm saying is there is a culture and heart of generosity that is in, intertwined in the businesses of the kingdom of heaven. And when you live with such a disposition... Not only do you see the ethereal truth of God and fill them, but you see the practical reality of what takes place. And Peter was an example of that. He made his business to be about God. So in 10, God blessed him. Fourth point right here. Fourth point right here so we can get on. Overflow comes from obedience. Overflow comes from obedience. Verse number six. When they had done so, they caught. Verse number six, when they had done so, they caught. Notice the progression of the verse there. It doesn't say, Jesus said, all right, you're going to get a lot of big fish. They caught all the fish, and then they let down their nets to receive the fish. No, no, no. God said, cast, cast your nets on the other side, and then they caught the fish. What some of us want to do is we hold our nets on the side of what God is saying. And we're saying, okay, God, you told me to cast the net. I can't wait. You show me the big old blessing I'm going to get, and then I'll cast the net. It doesn't work that way. You got to have faith. You got to have trust. You got to have something greater called obedience. Because when you're obedient to God, you get the overflow of God. If you're not obedient to God, you don't get the overflow. You can pray for it. You can fast for it. You can testify about it. You can put it in your journal. I'm down for it. But you will not actually see it. Why? Because overflow is given to people God can trust through obedience. Yes. Obedience. We could spend the rest of the day, go get lunch and come back. We could have a full seminar on that obedience. But let's be honest, sometimes it's not good to hear about it because that actually requires me to do something. <laughs> you know, like if you like, oh, man, I went and saw a doctor recently and they said, all right, this is what's going on in your body. We need you to do these things. And I was like, OK. I was like, and what's the other option? They were like, there is no other option. I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to do these things. <laughs> and they weren't big things. They were just something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to create margin in my life. I didn't want to create space to have to know what was taking place. I didn't want to have to make that my priority. I just wanted the overflow, but I couldn't have it unless I was obedient. But can I tell you what's funny? The moment I started doing what the doctor said, I started seeing the results that I wanted. Let me say this. The moment you start doing what God has said, you will see something far greater than the results you wanted. You will see his results, which are higher, which are greater than you can even fathom or understand. It's the obedience of overflow. When we step in obedience, there is an overflow that begins to take place. This is true not only of our individual lives, but this is true of us as a church as well. So right now, what I get to do is the fun season as we're coming into the end of the message is begin to share all these dynamics that are taking place in the life of the church. Now, let me share this. As I begin to talk about these things, there's going to be some of you that have questions, comments, all these things in between. Listen, I love you. I'm excited for it. Come and talk to me. I gave you my cell phone number already. We're definitely going to mute that because I'm not putting that on YouTube right now. But for anybody else in this room, you can definitely have my number because I love to talk to you. Okay. We're available to you. But what What's going on, if you've been a part of Collab for any season of time, you've known over the last few years, we have been in a season of transition of two churches that have been merging together. Me and my wife, Jacqueline, we came from Missouri. We parachuted in here right before COVID, had a God dream of planting a church, 
God had a better dream. It was even greater. We got partnered with another amazing church. And there's been all these dynamics of people collaborating, working together. And we've been people, people have been getting saved. People have been getting baptized. People have been getting healed. Let me say this. We have some, we have some really big healings that have happened in the house in the last month that we're going to be sharing in a few weeks. And I just feel like I need to say this. If you've been praying for healing, let me tell you, this house is becoming a house of healing. And just because you're not hearing it every Sunday from the stage doesn't mean it's not happening in the seats. Some of the best thing you can do to figure out testimonies is not wait from a finite man on a mic, but talk to other people as they begin to share what God is doing. Man, those are going to be awesome to share. So we've been on this journey of what's been taking place. And since then, we went to uh, North Miami Beach High School. I got to get all my high schools together. And we were there for a season. We launched. God did some amazing things. Then they went under construction. Praise God. It's starting to look really cool. And then we moved here to North Dade Middle. And this has been an amazing time. We've got a lot of great memories. Y'all remember in Christmas whenever it began to snow? And that was a great time. So many different stuff. We did a serve day once. All kinds of cool things. But during the in-between area of that, we bought a building called Collab HQ. And many of you have heard about this. Collab HQ was an investment purchase that the board and the church made so that the church could begin to have a property that was in the forefront of North Miami where the growth is beginning to take place. If you look down Biscayne, 167th, 163rd, anybody seen all those high rises that are going up? Anybody seen that? I prophesy, that's traffic, okay? It's coming, all right? But not only has that happened, there's tons of growth, there's tons of just movement of uh, businesses that are going there. And so getting that property in a place that would not only gain value over time, but also was a rental space for offices. So since then, we've been able to have multiple tenants that come in that are renting from the bottom floor of this uh, two floor building. And so they're able to get floor space. And then at the same time, we've been able to do our secondary events where we've had our worship night. We've had some dream team nights. We had a financial generosity teaching. But then also what we've been doing in this season is really just getting the space ready for the future of what's to come. Some things that have been known, some things that have been unknown. Because when we first bought this property, well, it's a great property, it only had about 26, maybe a few, take a few like parking spots. And so it became a place that didn't really work for us in that season to actually meet as a community. But what's incredible, like we talked about two weeks ago, whenever you begin to trust God with his vision, he'll begin to give you provision at the right time. Remember when you trust the Lord, it says, I'll be a light under your feet. Well, I don't know if, you, if you're like me, but my feet go one step at a time. Sometimes I want the light to be all the way over there, but God's like, if I put it all the way there, you would trip over your feet now. And so as God began to put the light on our feet, as we began to pray and process as lead pastors, me and Jacqueline, and then with our overseers, then with the board, we began to realize some of the opportunity that was taking place. So we began to renovate Collab HQ, getting the second floor from looking like it was ancient to being something spectacular, beginning to talk about all the processes and the details of what parking would look like, and then began to reach out and have conversations, talking with the city and with the commission. And so what I want everyone to know about what I'm so excited to announce is that in the very coming soon future, Collab Church will be moving from North Dade Middle to Collab HQ to hold Sunday services. Come on, can we math praise? It's huge. All right, man, we're over time, but it's okay. Somebody text Collab Kids and let them know. All right, so listen, we, we're so excited, okay? Oh, thank you, X. Welcome to the miracle, okay? Now listen, this isn't the miracle. There's so much more. This is just the phrase of this season. So for those of you that have never been to this space, you're absolutely gonna love it. Let me say that. We have been working like crazy to retrofit it, to making sure that it can hold the current context of our services, as well as being ready for multiple services. But also, your boy's been praying and working on parking, okay? So there's buildings to the left and the right of us. On the left side, there's about 50 plus spaces and we are 80% of the way approved to get signed off to use that on Sundays. Come on, can we just thank the Lord for that miracle that's coming? Come on, that's huge, all right? Also, across the street, we got something called Publix. And Publix parking, I've been made aware of by the commissioner, I'm gonna to continue to check, is free parking, okay? So for those of you that are younger and agile and can obey crosswalks, that's gonna be available. There's also free parking all around the other block that you can see. The other thing is on the other side, there's a medical building as well as a rabbi scroll school. And I'm having conversation with them this month to see if we can use their parking as well. Okay, so what does that mean? That means on Sunday morning, we have a permanent place in this season we can meet. Come on somebody, this is huge. 
So what's happening right now, there's a lot of renovations that are taking place because one of the biggest priorities of our house is making sure that Collab Kids is taken care of. So we're putting in a massive soundproof wall on the second floor so that the Collab Kids have their own separate experience. This is huge. We're going to be able to build a stage for them, have permanent teaching, different individual classrooms, what we already do here but on the next scale. The next big thing that we're doing is beginning to set up not only for all of the live streaming on a Sunday service, but also some other elements that we've talked about on other Vision Sunday days of big dreams that we have and so in this season we're getting the house ready we're getting the house ready we're making sure everything's going to work so that we can head into collab hq now the question would be well why wouldn't we just call collab hq collab church the reason why is because we want collab hq to become a beacon of a place people can come for a multi-collaborating workspace the reason why is over time as the church grows there will be a day we will grow out of that building but we want to make sure people in the city don't go, oh, the church is gone. I guess that building doesn't work. We want that church, that building still to function so that it can be a storm of income. It can be the area for all kinds of different projects we got going on. Don't have time to go into all that. But then also what we want to make sure is taking place is that we're structuring our community, our language in a way where we understand the church is never a building. The church is people. The church is people. And listen, I love buildings. I'm so excited for a permanent space. But listen, we can never get married to a physical location that we forget to be married to the bride of Christ and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We got to know that. Some of us love bricks more than we love the brick maker. All right, that was a little fleshy. I apologize for that, okay? There's no one in here. I was talking to a different pastor. Yeah, PG, PG. <laughs> so, okay, so... We are very excited. Big question. So when is the move-in date? Listen, heaven knows I don't. Here's why. We're currently talking with the city to get all the permits, all the documents, everything that we need so we can fully be approved to go into this space. And so what I wanted to let the church know is there are four things that we're going to be praying about as a community over the next month. My desire and prayer is that by June, we would be in the building. Say, come on, somebody. June, we're going to be in the building. So what that means is what we got to pray in. And listen, this is war prayer. Like, don't be like, God bless it. Listen, you, you, let's go, okay? Favor with the city. We need favor with North Miami Beach, with commissioners, with the mayor. We need them to know us and want us. We need them to go, wow, you make such a different we hear, difference we hear throughout the city. We would love you just to be here and be a part. We want favor with the city. Also, we want favor with parking. And listen, parking isn't just for all of us now, but for the new growth that is going to come in. We have people come in all the time. They're like, oh, I've heard this is like a church. Do I just come here on Sunday? And I'm like, no, you go to North Dade Middle. You go over the highway, around the woods, to grandmother's house we go. And they're like, I don't leave this area. I'm like, okay, God bless you. So we have people that already want to come. So we want to think about the parking for the future of multiple services, of all those dynamics, favor with the city with that too. Then the third thing is we all want a new zeal for God. We want to be zealous for God as the days of our youth, where we first met Jesus, where there was nothing greater. We want to be zealous for God. And people already say that. They walk in, they're like, these are nice people. They're excited people. Well, let me tell you, they haven't seen nothing yet because our best days are truly ahead. And the fourth thing, we want a passion for the lost like never before. I've been screaming church in the wild since I got into this city and it's not going to stop. There are people that are begging for salvation. They're begging for hope. They're begging for a miracle. Could it be that God's about to put us in 975 North Miami Beach Boulevard so we can be that miracle in this season? Could it be God's going to use your invitation? He's going to use your story. He's going to use your testimony to do something great. I don't think could it be. I think it will be. And we'll watch and wonder at what God begins to do. So this is what's begun again to take place over the next month. For some of you, you may have more questions. I'm here. I'm ready to talk. You can come to the space. We'd love to give you a tour, show you some of the construction of what's taking place. We'll have pictures as we continue to move on. But the reason that we're doing this church is not just so we can have a permanent building. There's multiple reasons. For one is the finances of the building. I don't know if you know this, but we have to rent this place out every single month. Now that we're in a place where we can operate there, we can take the finances from this building and we can completely put it into that. Continuing to work on set that up, but then also investing into the future of what God is doing, into the work of ministry. This also begins to open things where we begin to have midweek gatherings, where we begin to have things, I'm gonna say these things, they're not happening in the next month, but in the future, collab youth, men's breakfast, women's Bible studies, uh, collab micro gatherings, uh, generosity groups, like all these different things. Listen, those are gonna happen, okay? But listen, just like the story we read, there was a time where Jesus stopped the work of the ministry 
so he could create some space so he could sit down, okay? What we're doing in this next season, what we've been doing for the last few years is getting some space so we could sit down. Now, for some of you, you've been part of the church longer than I've been alive. Awesome. I love it. And I mean that with love. I genuinely do. So I understand for some of you, you're like, man, this has just been a wild transition. This has been a journey. And I'll say this, for some of you may be like, I'm, I like love what's happening. I love what's going on, but I still got like some, some trust things that are happening. Listen, I get it. Let's have a conversation. But also, let's look at the fruit of what God has done over the last few years, but the fruit that's coming. Like, listen, you know, Jesus, whenever he walked into the situation, he didn't make it where Peter didn't have fish in the boat. He just walked into it and then said, yo, let's go get some fish in the boat. Can I tell you, me and Jacqueline give you our word. We are putting fish in the boat by the grace of God, by the ministry we're doing, by the hands that we're putting in, our systems, our structure, all these things. But to do that, it takes time because we could start all these things as soon as we get into the building. But then what happens is we make a big boom and then there's a whole lot of burnout. Because to do many great things, you gotta have many great people. But if we do a few great things on God's great timing, then we can do greater things than we could ask or imagine. Because we don't need chancellor ideas. We don't need Pastor Gilbert ideas. We don't need Pedro ideas. We need God ideas. But to do that, we gotta sit. We gotta take time, we gotta listen. And so we're still having our Sunday services. We're still having our secondary events. But as we continue to move in that space, realize things are gonna continue to happen. But then also what I wanna to begin to invite you to go on the journey of is for some of you, maybe you've been on the edge of getting involved into the life of the church. And that could be because you're like, hey, I really don't know where a spot is for me. Listen, the journey we're going into, it's gonna take all hands. I called Luke Holter, he's a prophet for those of you who don't know. He spoke a word over this house almost three years ago and I began to update him on everything and he just began to chuckle and he was like, yeah, I knew, I knew all this was happening. <laughs> and then he like shared some more stuff with me. And in that prophecy, he talked about the next season the church would go in, three things would take place. There would be a structuring of leadership, structure of government, and then there would be a structure of the spirit, the supernatural spirit. And then after the third one began to take place, that the church of the fleet of ships that had precious cargo would move into a physical building and it would grow exponentially from flesh blood. It would not be from sheep that were mad at other churches coming in, but it would people that were lost being found. But to do that, he said, all hands gotta be on deck. So I wanna invite you, if you're not on board yet, jump on board. There's no better time to be a part of life of the church. I don't know what my seat is. Come and talk to me. I've given you my phone number. Like I'm here. I would love to serve you. Maybe it's leading a Bible study in the future. Maybe it's being part of leading the culture class. Maybe it's working with collab kids. Maybe it's throughout the week coming and helping him with filing, with calling people, with different capacities of things, whatever that looks like. There's a place for every single one of us. And maybe you don't know what that looks like. Hey, come and have a conversation. But then also the last thing I would say is you make this prayer list a part of your thing is pray that God would do this in your life in a bigger way. I already know he's gonna do it. Because what happens is a, a church only mirrors the life of the individuals in a church. So a lot of times people think, oh, God's blessing that church is getting really big. No, God's blessing the individual people and that's why the overflow is getting big. So if God's doing this in our life, he's restructuring things, he's moving some things, he's creating margin, that just means he's doing it in our community. The church always reflects what's happening to the flock, okay? So what I want you to begin to pray is as you begin to see in the external what God's doing on an organizational context, begin to pray that God would make that individually for you. Some of you, God's gonna to begin to shift your jobs. Some of you, God's gonna to begin to remain in your job at a different capacity, a prayer of Jabez, a growing that's gonna happen. For some of you, God's gonna be give the fresh zeal for dreams he's given you. He's gonna give you passion. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm excited to cheer you along the way. Because as God builds the church, he's gonna build people. Because people are the church. And I'm excited for what's ahead. So I took 13 extra minutes today. And I'm not sorry because I'm excited and I love you. And I got you tacos. All right, I didn't. Jacqueline did, Chad did, everyone else. But listen, oh man, I'm, I'm excited, okay? And for every single one of us, I wanna just say God's about to do some great things. And along this journey, again, if you have any questions, come and talk to me. I know I've said that four times, but they say repeat something seven times and people will actually do it. So add the other three. Come and talk to us if you have any questions. But get ready. Over the next month, we'll continue to share more details. But we're going to go on this journey of what this miracle looks like, but also welcoming ourselves to the miracle of not only a physical building, but by faith through what God's going to do in your life. Because greater things are truly about to happen than we can ask or imagine.